Good evening and welcome to the Tenement Museum. Um, we are excited to be here with you tonight and we're hosting Margaret Chin, who's the author of Stuck, Why Asian Americans Don't Reach the Top of the Corporate Ladder. You can see the book here. The book came out in August of 2020, but there was a lot going on in August of 2020. And so we're excited now to have this opportunity to dive into the book and to the content. So Margaret Chin is a professor of sociology at Hunter College and the Graduate Center. Um, her first book, Sewing Women, was about uh, Chinese and Korean women who worked in the garment industry. We at the Tenement Museum loved the book so much that we actually created an exhibit about it. You can go into a recreation of an 1980s garment shop that in many ways was influenced um, by uh, Professor Chin's findings, as well as the oral histories that she did with uh, members of the garment, uh, garment workers. Um, her book tonight um, came out in August of 2020, and it looks at how racism is holding back Asian Americans from advancing in the corporate world. Um, so we, um, I, my name is Annie Polland. I'm the president of the Tenement Museum, and I've had the honor of working with, uh, with Margaret Chin on many of the exhibits and education that we've done here at the Tenement Museum over the years. And I'm also so excited uh, that she is a, a member of the Tenement Museum's Board of Trustees. So this is a family conversation. Um, and we also welcome your questions. So please feel free to send your questions into the chat. Um, and as we get into the program, we'll be able to draw on those questions so that you're part of the conversation as well. Um, you can also buy the book on our website. Um, and so we'll dive right in. So uh, Margaret, tell me why, what motivated you to write this book? Well, um, I guess one, I think it was um, in the early 2010s, 2013, 2014, um, I was at a reception for um, Harvard incoming freshmen. And, um, you know, at this kind of reception, all the admitted students get invited and they're all talked to by the admissions officers and all the interviewers trying to get the students to um, go to Harvard to get, you know, convince them to go. And in the room, there were lots of Asian Americans, I noticed, lots of Asian Americans, a lot of lots of Asian Americans with their parents kind of celebrating. And one of the admissions officers just offhandedly asked, so, hey, you know, ever since you went to Harvard, I'm a Harvard alum, um, you know, we've admitted so many Asian Americans. What are you all you guys doing? You know, I don't actually know. And it'd be nice to know if all of you are um, actually, you know, leaders in corporations and stuff. And I looked at him, I go, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. So um, I said, you know, that's a good study for sociology. Um, since I like to study the workplace, I'll go study the professional workplace. And that's what got me um, going um, to study this. And so what I did was first, the first thing I did of course was to look at statistics. And um, I found that um, Asian Americans aren't doing so well in the corporate world. So one example that I'll tell you right now is that um, in 2020, there were only um, a dozen CEOs who were Asian Americans. That's 2.4% Asian, Ameri Asian Americans. 1% African-Americans, 3.4% Hispanics, and 6.8% white women in the Fortune 500. So the big picture is among CEOs, only 8% of CEOs are non-white in 2020. And so the, the term that you use is that of the, the bamboo ceiling. So that if there's like a glass ceiling for women, there's a bamboo ceiling for Asian-Americans. And where does that ceiling occur? So, um, so for uh, the bamboo ceiling, and some people don't like me using bamboo ceiling or don't like the term bamboo ceiling. Um, so sometimes I'll use career ceilings or professional ceilings. And mostly because I think a lot of people just don't know that it exists. And it exists for people who are actually um, entering uh, or moving past mid-level. I mean, like um, at Harvard, right, there are over 25%. Asian Americans are about... 20 to 25% of college uh, entering classes these days. So they don't look like they're hitting the ceiling at that point. And it doesn't look like Asian Americans um, have a hard, hard time finding jobs, but what they do have a very hard time is, is moving past the mid-level. So one of the things I think you noted in the book is that when you started to look into this or you started to look at some of the research about it, people were saying, oh, give it time. Like this is, maybe this just takes a little bit of time. So give it time. So I'm curious kind of 
uh, you responded really beautiful to that, beautifully to that. And I wanted, you know, you to give, uh, uh, give you a chance to tell everyone how your, your methodological response to that. Okay, sure. Give it time. <laughs> sure. So, um, you know, I'm, yeah, it's like how, well, the first thing I thought was how long do I have to wait? You know, I myself am, um, an American born, so I'm a second generation my, my father immigrated when he was 12 and my mom immigrated, you know, in the 1960s. And um, so I was born in the 1960s and that brings me to a, a population um, that actually is uh, quite the, um, um, the numerous right now because the immigration laws changed in 1965. So, and that's over 50 years ago. So that means that there are a lot of people here like me who are over the age of 50. And so when I said, how come it takes so long? Why do I have to wait so long? I mean, like I've been at it for a very long time, but Asian Americans, most studies on Asian Americans are always done on people who are younger, done on um, Asian Americans going into schools, going into high schools or going to college. And there's very little done on Asian American second generation going into the, the work world. So I basically said, why do I have to wait so long? I went to Harvard. I'm, I'm actually married to a Harvard spouse. I have a Harvard kid. You know, why really do I have to wait so long? Why actually there are people like me who actually are waiting for a long time? When in fact, um, we've had uh, programs that helped um, us advance, um, but we still haven't made it that far. And so the idea is to figure out what's going on. Yeah. So how did you do that? So how did you kind of set up how you were gonna discuss uh, this question or analyze this question? Yeah, so um, I figured that I should probably do what I did, do what I do best is to interview people. And um, I'm not a quantitative person. So what I did was I went back and um, I decided to go through my own networks, mm -hmm. my own friends, um, and look at all the friends I have through my, um, my college networks. So some are Ivy League college graduates, some are just other liberal arts college graduates and kind of ask them where they're going, uh, what, what's going on with them at work and how far they're advancing and some of the reasons why or why not. So I um, interviewed um, all second generation and what I call 1.5 second generation immigrants and the 1.5 uh, um, generation immigrants are actually those who were born um, overseas, but came here before the age of 13. So when you look at them and when you speak to them, you would not know that they're foreign born. Um, so they're actually um, gone to school here. Uh, they know all the cultural references here. And they're very, very much just like the second generation who are born here. However, the census that we use, they don't actually um, count them. Um, in that particular way, they count them as the foreign born. So when you look at the census, you actually see that they're actually more second generation or, or you actually see that they're more foreign born. And so what I did was um, I looked at the data and I pulled out the 1.5 generation and I lumped them together with those who were born in the US. And they became this broadly defined group that we would treat as a second generation um, socially, right? And then so what I found was that 40% of professionals age uh, 25 to 64 were actually in this group. So if you were a lawyer or if you were in media or you were in the corporate professional world, you would turn around and look about half of you are this group. Half of you, um, people who would look at you would believe that you're all really Americanized, all speak English just fine and um, all had great college degrees um, you know, no matter where you went and are doing fine in the work world. And I think that belies, you know, mm -hmm. what's going on. It hides and, um, and people assume that Asian Americans aren't moving up once they find out that number because they're all foreign born. But in reality, they're this group, this broadly defined second generation. 
So you showed in this really important way that it's it's time to look at it. And you were able to broaden the base by moving beyond the census's determination, because for the purposes of what you were studying, how Americanized you were, how Americanized you were was really the relevant factor. So then now looking at this group of people, what was the trajectory that that they were they were going forward with and 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 how did it stop? So if we work backwards, you know, we think about the the second generation as children to high school to college. What was the what were the fi- the common findings about this group? Yeah, so the first thing I found out about this group, I I asked them about getting into going to school and going into college, and all of them, and th- this is like um, Asian Americans from all over the world, so East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, they all shared with me what I call the Asian American playbook, and this Asian American playbook is you know, verbal advice. It's not written anywhere. You can't buy this playbook, you know, on Amazon or anything like that, but it's just written. And it's, I mean, not written, it's just verbal and it's told to everybody. And basically, let's see if I can find this quote of um, this guy, Vince, who shared with me um, a quote. It's in the beginning of one of the chapters. Um, He's a Chinese American who graduated college in the 1990s and he's now a law partner. And he says, My mother told me that if I wanted to get to Harvard, I needed to do the same activities as the Asian American kid who got into Harvard the year before. So on top of good grades and scores, I needed to be first violin in the school orchestra and I needed to be a captain of my swim team and I did and I got into Harvard. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what he said he did. And all almost all of the others said, yeah, I follow some advice like this where I just worked hard, got good grades um, and tried my best to um, get into college. That's the story they actually all told each other. They didn't tell each other any other story except for that one. So that advice seemed to work okay. A lot of them, you know, all of them got into college. All of them got a job. You know, it didn't matter. I interview people who didn't go to Harvard too. I interview people who went to actually CUNY schools, um, the SUNY schools, and everything from one end to the other, and a lot of liberal arts schools in two, um, uh, as well. So all of these people did similar things, and they all got in. And what I learned was this particular playbook was an Asian American playbook. It's made for students who were born and bred and raised in the U.S. because this playbook doesn't work in Asia. So it's parents trying to figure out actually how to fulfill the American dream. And it's their one way of sharing it, sharing this information to their kids because a lot of their parents actually don't have that experience. So the parents are immigrant parents for the most part. Yeah, profession. I was just going to say that it, it, there's the roots of that in your work on sewing women, because I think one of the things you wrote about was how the garment workers, yes, they were going in to sew and they were going in because they had insurance and they were going in and they were unionized and that was very important. But they, it, what was also really important was the community that they built among themselves and that a lot of it was like, oh, my kid is a junior, your kid is a senior, what should they be doing? And like just gathering information from the other women in the shop. So it's almost as if the playbook was being stitched together, even in the garment industry. Yeah, absolutely. So these women were actually sharing similar kinds of information, like what school should my kid be going to? What should they be studying? What should they be doing? So that verbal playbook was shared among the garment workers who were working class. And it was also shared, I found out, um, from parents who were actually professionals. So if you can, you know, so one of the things I found is that the majority of the people I interviewed, they are children of professionals, not of the working class. Mm-hmm. So the kids who actually go to a lot of these brand name colleges, liberal arts colleges or private colleges are actually children of scientists and professionals who actually immigrated after 1965. Some of them are children of working of the working class as well, but so therefore the children of the working class as well as the children of professionals all share these same stories. And part of it is that they don't actually have information um, that others in who went to college in the US, Asian Americans who went to college in the US that could share to them. So they did the best they could and use whatever information they could find and share it among themselves, how their kids could get into college. And this playbook is only, only works in the US. So it's an Asian American, American phenomenon. And after I wrote this book, 
um, when I presented this, there would be people of all different backgrounds who would say to me, wait a minute, I have that same playbook. Are you sure it's Asian American? And I go, well, okay, somebody else could interview other people and find out. But yeah, I, I actually think maybe it's not just Asian American. Maybe it's something about the American dream. And so, yeah, so if you boil down the, the, the kind of the essence or the main points of the, of, uh, in this case, the Asian American playbook, and it might resonate across others, but if you were to just boil it down to like a few points, what, what, what does the playbook tell the children? The playbook basically tells the children, work hard, do your best, you know, get, um, get a good job, it, keep your head down too, doesn't tell them to complain, and, um, and you will end up being successful. And it works up until? Mid-level. Okay mid-level in the career. And because even when, um, to get a job, a lot of them from these places, these days I found out that a lot of them interview, um, in their interviews they have tests sometimes and all these things to get jobs. So it seems that a good schooling, a good education helps them get their foot in the door. I think some people who are able to use networking skills you know, with connections, with if they had mentors or sponsors early on, because they might have been in programs early on, might have been able to um, get different kinds of jobs. But basically, if you did this, you were able to um, get a job. But it changes, the rules change um, when you move into, um, when you want to move past mid-level. And what are the types of jobs, just kind of paint a picture for like what, what kinds of industries are we, are we talking about? In this yeah, so, so I, um, I only interview people who worked in law, who worked in finance and in media, media, not um, in like media corporations like HBO and like, um, um, what's the other one? just blanked out, but like HBO and Showtime, uh, stuff like that. So they worked in media companies that might have um, dealt with um, moving and, and um, pushing out media, um, like media for what we use every day. So those are some of the big companies now. And um, so those are the basic ones. And um, I didn't look at law. I mean, I didn't look at medicine. I didn't look at any of the STEM fields um, just because I was hoping that maybe it'd be different. Um, later on, I learned that moving on up in those fields too, are almost as hard or just as hard for Asian Americans. So what happens when someone, so basically someone's been successful their whole life. They've listened to the playbook. Um, they've gone to a, a special high school or specialized high school and they've gone to a Harvard or an Ivy League or a, a, good, a good school. And then they've made it into, they've gone to law school or they've you know entered um, the, the corporate world, the media world, what happens at mid-level that stops the progression that should happen? Yeah, so one of the problems is that, so this, the story that I, 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 I failed to leave out was that the whole story is about you working it hard yourself. And I think what a lot of us may characterize it is um, pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, right? So the thing that happens when people get to a, um, um, mid-level is that they learn that just their um, um, technical skills, just the, the putting out um, PowerPoint slides, just doing the presentations, just doing the things that your manager wants you to do makes you look really great. But lots of times that won't earn you the promotion. And part of it is that by the time you get to a certain level where you're moving up, um, it's really important to be trusted in an organization. And Trust is something that people need to uh, build over time. And a lot of the um, Asian Americans that I interviewed, a lot of them focused on making sure that their skills are great, making sure that their presentations are great, just like they did in school. If they got a great grade on it in school, that moves them up. In the work world in the very beginning, their first two or three uh, performance reviews, oh, and everybody I talked to had performance reviews, mm -hmm. Um, those performance reviews, if they're good, they felt like they were automatically going to get promoted. But at a certain level, that's not what you need to show anymore. You need to show things like initiative. You need to show things like um, um, presenting and um, presenting to um, 
uh, having important projects that are assigned to you and then um, doing well in those projects. But part of it is you have to be able to get those important projects. Mm -hmm. Part of it is that you might have to work in, um, in a part of a corporation that allows you to move that way. So what I also learned too, is that some of the uh, interviewees worked in different parts of corporations, the front office, the back office and the middle office. And some of these places actually have different kinds of uh, promotion or career ladders. Some of those uh, areas actually make it harder for you to be promoted. Um, so they may want to keep you in a certain place and the, um, it may take you a lot longer to be promoted. So those are things that a lot of the, um, my um, employees didn't know when they first got their jobs mm -hmm. and nobody actually shared that with them. Nobody told them. Um, the networks that um, where the parents use to get the information about the Asian American playbook, a lot of them didn't have the networks that actually shared that information with them, the, the young employees that is. Mm -hmm. um, not so young, they went up to age 50 something. So they were, um, I, I neglected to tell you too that I interview people who graduated from the classes of 1980, mm -hmm. 1990 and the 2000s. Mm -hmm. And those were I thought people who were old enough to have made it to the very top, mm -hmm. made it to the very middle and um, to, um, you know, to somewhat pass entry level. So the playbook teaches characteristics that help get you there, but then kind of failed beyond that. But I think the other part of it is that the playbook really has faith in the idea of the American dream and the idea of, of meritocracy. And in some ways, I guess, is this calling into question whether some of these corporate spaces really are that open, really are that inclusive, really are that expansive? So what are the kinds of, I, I guess, you know, one of the things that struck me in the book too was how the parents felt, okay, they might experience discrimination. They might not get a mortgage they should get. They might be uh, not taken seriously because of an accent, but they felt they were raising these children who spoke English and, you know, sh sh should, should never really experience discrimination. So yet, like are, they're, they're experiencing discrimination in some ways in, in, in the corporate world and the, the playbook didn't prepare them for that. So in some ways it was the very faith in the American dream that the playbook has that's also not giving them the tools to kind of encounter some of the biases in the workplace. Yeah, so for Asian Americans, I think when I talked to them about racism, a lot of them didn't acknowledge that they themselves faced racism. Um, but they did say that their parents did. So for some of them, it was like, yeah, racism, that existed for my parents. They were mocked, they were made fun of, you know, I had to translate for them, all these things. So they remember very clearly, they, some of the parents didn't get any mortgages. They remember, you know, um, things that even the parents, when they were supervising workers, they weren't able to do it. Um, so the, the, the workers that I talked to, the employees, they all knew that, the young Asian Americans, they all knew that. Um, uh, so when I asked them about racist incidents, a lot of them had a very difficult time talking about it. Although I could see that the corporate structure uh, was racist, the higher up they got, uh, the fewer people of color got up there, including Asian Americans. Asian Americans were often left out of um, programs that helped promote promote them, but they didn't see it because the way we learn racism in the US, and that's for everybody here in the US, is that racism affects African Americans. African Americans, you know, face things like um, police brutality where they could get killed. Um, they don't get picked up by cabs. You know, they don't, um, there's discrimination in schools and education. So, but Asian Americans may not face those particular things. Right, so we learn, or they learn too, that Asian Americans may not face quote unquote racism, but all groups actually face different kinds of things that can be labeled racism. So Asian Americans actually, and for this particular group, and I think more and more of them are realizing it this year because they've come back to me and say, you know what? I, that was racist when they didn't promote me. That was whatever when, you know, it was definitely racist when they, you know, like the article in the New York Times this week, they mixed me up for somebody else. Mm -hmm. That was definitely racist when they didn't give me, you know, that project when I knew very well that I was supposed to be in line to get that project to do. 
I know very well. So all of these things, people were just beginning to call it racism. And I think it became very clear this particular year um, with all the, with the pandemic and with um, the anti-Asian violent cases, violence cases. Too. Yes, the New York Times article I thought was so, you know, showed that situation so well. Uh, there was one, I think of a, a, a woman who was a doctor or a nurse who worked in a hospital and said that she worked alongside this doctor and he repeatedly called her the name of a different Asian woman who worked in the hospital and she didn't correct him. But then she said, oh, then there was a new intern who was a white male and she showed him around and no one had a problem remembering this person's name, like at all. And it just kind of struck her. So some of these things are so prevalent and, and it's kind of like how, if, if the idea is that you're supposed to develop trust, how are you supposed to develop trust with people who can't remember your name? You know, you know, it's one thing if it happens once where someone says the wrong name, but like if this, this is happening repeatedly for so many people, how, how, how can you develop trust? Yeah, so, um, so one of the reasons why people can't move to the top is that it's really hard to develop this trust. And trust at the highest levels means that you're given a key to the organization, that way you can guard the organization too. So that means that people up there don't think that you can guard the organization like them, right? So the ways to develop this trust is to be, and, and when they first told me this, I thought it was some corporate gibberish. I literally thought it was corporate gibberish. And then I thought about it more and I found that there was actually research on it. And the research basically says that if you're competent and you're trusted, you can be a really great friend in the organization. But if you're competent and you're a foe and you're an enemy, then they don't want you at all. You could be very dangerous to the organization. So the stereotypes of Asian Americans is that they're all competent, right? Mm -hmm. They work hard, they do all these things and people love them because they make your boss look good. I make my boss look good, right? So they're, they have the stereotype, but what they don't have, and they have the stereotype and they're other, othered, O-T-H-E-R-E-D, othered for being this, because they don't have this well-rounded, holistic um, being. People don't see them that way. So one way of doing this to build trust is to get to know um, the people that you work with. Um, to show them around, let them know who you are. And if you're quiet, you can show interest in the things that people do. And those are small ways that people learn to build trust with people. And the ones that I found who could do it the easiest were the people actually who worked in or went to school in diverse schools or worked in diverse um, companies or actually had access to um, diverse programs like affirmative action programs. Mm -hmm. So these are people who may have, they may have in high school been in posse or in prep for prep or in SEO. Um, these are programs, they all exist in New York City. A lot of these New York City high school students know about these programs. They're for minority students and, and some of them, one of them I think doesn't include Asian Americans anymore, um, but my, uh, interviewees, respondents were part of those. And they actually learn, and why they did that was because they emulated the people who sponsored them and mentored them from early on. Mm -hmm. And then even in the work world, they knew that, oh yeah, I can build trust and you work side by side, you work shoulder to shoulder with all of these people around you. And um, you share what you know, and they learn and they share what they know, and you begin to build that trust. Mm -hmm. And I think for um, parents who didn't speak English, it's really hard for them to model this for their kids because it's hard if you can't speak English, you can't really verbalize what you're actually feeling. So it is hard to build trust, but your kids who are completely fluent should be able to do that. So part of it is I think on the part of the corporations and the executives, they can't, they don't know how to build this trust or they don't see Asian Americans, even though they may be trying um, so they are racist, right? They're racist because they don't see Asian Americans as fully, you know, a full person. They see them as a stereotype, the model minority stereotype, in fact, right? And then some Asian Americans are, are like this, but they don't seem to be recognized. But some may have a hard time trying to build this trust because they've actually never been told to do this. So if you, you know, could, if you could write a playbook for the corporations to improve the situation, what would be your suggestions to the to the corporations, to the law firms, um, to to kind of write this this situation? Yeah. So um, from listening to the people who have made it, and from watching what's going on in the corporations, because part of what I did too is I, I interviewed 
um, all these people, but I also went to um, conferences too, to listen to what people were saying in corporations and how they move people up and or didn't. Um, I would say that they should actually have more um, um, executive level training programs targeted to um, people of color, including Asian Americans and women, um, because it's actually all the articles, New York Times, everybody says how, you know, how awful the situation is in terms of the numbers of people of color on boards and in the executive levels in these corporations. So they should actually have executive training programs the very first day that you hire somebody. Mm -hmm. And in those programs, you should actually have um, mentors and sponsors, as well as teaching um, skills so that, and exposing these new employees to different areas in the organization so that they can move to all parts. Now, um, these uh, programs actually were abundant in the 1980s when I graduated um, college, because um, I know people who were in them. I actually think I was in one when I actually worked for IBM for six years, so I actually think I was in one. But then by the 1990s and the 2000s, they were kind of taken away, and that's why we see a stall. And one of the reasons why is that before, in the 1980s, these corporations used to um, move people up through their own career ladders, through their own pipelines, but now corporations are merging and, um, <laughs> and I guess uh, disbanding. And so when they invest in people to move up, they feel like they're losing money. So what I would suggest is that if you had these programs there, if Asian Americans can be included in those programs to expand those programs. So if there are 10 slots, and you don't have Asian Americans in it, expand to the 13 or 15 slots to include Asian Americans and for all organizations to start these pipeline programs because what you're actually doing is that you're actually making people, um, moving them up. And when people leave your organization, you might get someone from another organization back who can, uh, who is capable and who is actually part of this pipeline program to actually diversify the top of your own organization. I'm curious if you've had any like corporate um, executives uh, who are white men read the book or hear you speak and say, oh, I didn't realize, you know, I need to do something different. Because again, I think it's like there, there has to be something too where some of the people who are perpetrating <laughs> the, the conditions um, recognize that they too have to change, that it's not just a matter of training others as much as it's like they have to change their own culture. So I'm just curious if any, if you've had that kind of response at all. Yeah, so I've actually heard, you know, part of it is that some of these organizations, um, they don't actually count um, who's at the top. They don't actually know how many people are at the top. If they see one Asian American, they actually think there may be many more behind them or many more along with them, but that's not the case. So part of it, one person actually said, oh my God, I didn't realize that Asian Americans or the other groups, we actually had so few. So one good thing is that people are actually counting um, who's up there. And, um, and the, the main thing is that um, I tell them that if you don't intentionally include people, you may unintentionally exclude them. Mm -hmm. And so I find that for the corporate leaders um, who are non, who are white, let's say, I think that's the most shocking part. Part of it is that um, Asian Americans are actually not moving up as fast as they think they are, and um, the reasons why they aren't. Um, and it's, I think it's hard for people to um, uh, get over or understand how the model minority um, is actually a myth. Um, Asian Americans aren't actually model minorities at the bottom and at the top. So one question I had too is that, um, and I know that this focused on the Asian American community, but are there any like historical precedents for this kind of second generation phenomenon where there's been a push to Americanize um, and there's been movement in one direction, but that movement's been stalled for due to discrimination or due to kind of you know different different conditions in the workplace that that weren't part of the plan? Yeah, so um, I actually think that um, if we, I mean, at present, I would say all the groups of color, right? Mm -hmm. So you have. Black, black, you know, Latino immigrants, um, uh, all, yeah, all of the uh, groups of color, they actually all face this right now, mm -hmm. children of immigrants. And lots of children of immigrants are seen as model minority. And the other thing they're seen as is, um, especially uh, that they're all seen as is not American, mm -hmm. that I think trust may also affect the other groups as well. 
And I think trust also affects Asian Americans in one way. One other way is that they're seen as forever foreigner, mm -hmm. you know, and they're not seen as part of the American story. And I think that adds another dimension to the lack of trust. Mm -hmm. If you're always seen as foreign, then you're only one ge geopolitical event away from being discriminated, you know, discriminated mm -hmm. against, right? So, and the other thing is, if you're always seen as foreign, where are your allegiances to, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's part of it. And then the last thing is that I think previously for the Jewish groups, right? I think they actually had a, a hard time, you know, uh, moving up in corporations. And for many of the um, earlier Jewish uh, communities in the 1940s and 50s, a lot of them were able to, um, and we were in an expanding society, social mobility was um, a lot easier, you know? Um, and um, so I think for a lot of people there, for Jews at that point, a lot of them could move up or actually build their own corporations who could move up. Right. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking about that. There's a scene in a movie called Gentleman's Agreement, which I think won the Academy Award in 1947. And it's Gregory Peck plays a journalist who is not Jewish, but pretends to be Jewish in order to see what what anti-Semitism, you know, what that is and, and how that plays out. And there's a scene where he's talking to a secretary who has who he didn't know was Jewish and she admitted she was Jewish, but said that to work in the office, that she had applied to work in the office, but had to change her name and change um, change different things in order to do that. And, and when you look at with the Jewish um, immigration, it's the second generation. If you look at like between, I think World War One and World War II name changes, uh, a woman named, a uh, historian named Kirsten Fermaglach did a, a, a book on this called A Rose by Any Other Name or A Rose in, a Rosenberg by Any Other Name, something yeah, like I that. Think that's it. Yeah. But, um, but she found that almost all the name changing petitions or a good proportion were from Jews who were not first generation. Because if they were first generation, they're working in the garment shop or they run their own store. But it's the second generation that was entering into some of the offices where there were um, there were there was a discrimination would change their names um, in order in order to move forward. Um, yeah, so this is really interesting because if you compare the groups, it seems like you know the American dream or the American trajectory for moving on up would be to assimilate to this mainstream. You change your name, you do all these things um, to become just like the rest of the white groups, right? So you you try that. But the thing is, if you're vis, if it's harder, <laughs> if you're visibly, you know, um, you can't change the way you look. So I think what what ends up is that. So at, at the point when Jews were um, moving up, there were really, I mean, the anti-Semitism was really awful. The Holocaust, I mean, all of this was going on, and so Asian Americans aren't facing that. And I have to say, African Americans, I believe, you know, I don't want to, you know, compare, but. To that extent, it what it's not quite like that. So the way to be, the way to move up, because we actually live in a in a society that's more plural now, has more different groups. Mm -hmm. The way the American story looks now is that we actually have to accept everybody for who they are, mm -hmm. right? So all the different groups have to be part of this American story and to kind of tell our own stories. Mm -hmm. And part of it is that people don't know our stories. And so that's what I love the Tenement Museum so much. <laughs> you guys tell these stories of all the different groups that make, um, that truly show like a, what a plural society is. You know, we all had terrible mm -hmm. things that happened to us, but we should recognize it for what it is. And we should also celebrate the good things too. Mm -hmm. you know? Right, and how people made choices to come here and uh, or move from one part of the country to another, and 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 how their families made sense of this. You know, that's I think what what is shared, which makes me wonder whether some of the corporations could benefit from having their employees do the Your Story, Our Story program that we do at the museum, which is a you know a website where it started with students, you know, picking an object that tells their family's immigration or migration story and writing about it. And it, it you know, it became a way for um, college classes and, and your classes started doing this too. And it became a way to kind of connect one to another with stories. And I think if, if trust is what we're after, then, you know, that's a way to build trust and I think create an American dream that truly is an American dream, right? That really is about encompassing all of the different stories um, and the struggles that, that are part of, of, 
of um, of our histories um, and and you know studying that together helps us helps us move forward. Yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. There was I, one one topic before we end um, that that we didn't get to, and that was the the situation of women too. So that if you look at the situation of Asian American women, why is that important to look at uh, in addition? Yeah. So um, I interviewed almost half of my interviewees were um, Asian American women. And there are a couple of things that actually um, um, stuck out to me. And so they, I, I call what they face the double bind. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of people use this terminology, double bind. But I also look at it through intersectionality, which is that it's not that they're discriminated against and they faced uh, the glass ceiling like all women. And they also face the bamboo ceiling or career ceilings like Asian Americans, right? And so, but the thing is when they're combined, it's actually doubly or more than doubly disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. So the things that these women face, and I, I guess, um, um, it, yeah, the things that they face are, are incredible um, uh, stereotypes. One has to do with, um, and the stereotypes of both, uh, both the Asian American women and being women together actually causes backlash. So what some of these things are is that Asian American women are sometimes um, seen as demure or acquiescent. Um, they're quiet, they don't speak out, um, and sometimes sexualized too. So those are stereotypes that Asian American women uh, face, but those, all of those stereotypes are feminized even more, they're hyper-feminine. And none of those stereotypes are what you would call or what you would see an Asian, a, a leader would have in a corporation, right? So all of these things that she may walk around and people may talk to her and assume that she's just quiet, she's not gonna do anything, she's just gonna be this helpful little girl. And that is in no way um, what a leader should do. And the thing is, a lot of the women that I spoke to actually felt like they weren't like that at all, mm -hmm. at all. In fact, one of the women said that she was actually loud. Um, so one of the women was actually loud. She worked on the um, uh, the trading floor. Oh, and, Ricky, right? Was yeah, Ricky, <laughs> absolutely, Ricky. And so she thought it was great. And they actually respected her. And she got promoted out of that trading room floor. And then when she got to the top and she was the same personality up there, she actually faced backlash there. Mm -hmm where they actually felt like you shouldn't be acting that way. You're an Asian American woman and uh, you should be quiet and demure. But the thing is being that way didn't help her get promoted at all. In fact, she felt that it actually held her back and they were being racist telling her otherwise because they couldn't accept her as who she really was. And when I met her, I thought, you know, she has all of the qualifications of moving up, but I've only met her once. So she's actually now, you know, there are a number of people, maybe not her, but a number of people who are actually working with um, executive trainers um, mm -hmm. to learn how to do this. So on their own, they actually feel this way, but I also feel that in the corporations, they're actually not uh, recognizing her that way. And the other thing, um, there are actually two more things that come out. Sometimes this whole thing about being hyper-feminine, women are actually sexualized too. Mm -hmm. And so there was this one story of this Asian American woman who actually worked in finance and she was sexually harassed and she didn't know who to turn to in the corporation. Um, she tried to turn to other workers and none of the other women workers, um, white or black actually believed her story mm -hmm. or if they believed her, they actually didn't support her. And part of it, she thought that they also believed in the same stereotype, mm -hmm. you know, so they didn't support her. And so she finally filed um, a suit and um, she got, she said she wasn't promoted because of the show. She got promoted and then uh, well, she filed a complaint. And then um, after she left the corporation, she could never find a job in the finance corporation again or in the finance world again. So she was um, blackballed out of the out of that, out of that work area, or out of that, um, you know, um, that career. So that's very sad. And so, after the Me Too movement started, mm -hmm. I actually got phone calls from a lot of other women who actually talked about that as well. Mm -hmm. So um, Asian American women, you know, face the stereotype of hyper sexualized, hyper feminine. The other one um, I call it, and um, is that they actually are um, uh, super tiger mommies. Mm -hmm. You know, so people are put on the mommy track, you know, and I think a lot of women know this. If you have kids, they may not give you those super projects. They may not put you on assignments where you have to travel and 
those assignments sometimes may lead you to meet others who can actually promote you. And so moms who are on the mommy track, um, lots of them feel like they're held back because they had a kid. That's not the case for dads, it's a double standard. Dads in the work world feel like, you know, you have a kid, you, you have lots more responsibility, we should promote you so that you can have more money so they can take care of your family, right? But that's the opposite for women. So tiger mommies, and a couple women mentioned this to me, it's like, they always feel like, I'm just only concerned about mothering my kid. Why did they think that way? And I think part of it is that of the tiger mom stereotype and about all that competition that people fear um, from you know, Asian American families raising their kids. So I think those two combined create that stereotype. So those are just a, a couple things that I noticed about the Asian American women. And the statistics show that Asian American women actually have one of the lowest uh, promotion rates, rates out of all the different groups, out of all the different, all the racial groups too. I love in general the way that you're able to kind of weave the stories into the statistics and that really it really kind of paints such a powerful picture to hear these stories one by one and then also to, to have that all together. Um, because I think my guess is for many people, these are things that they experienced on their own and didn't think that they were part of some kind of collective uh, phenomenon. And I guess I'm wondering too, and we touched on this a little bit earlier, you touched on it, but given the year that we've had, what do you think the impact of this year might be on, uh, on the situation that you describe? Um, you know, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so first one comment too, it's like, since I interviewed 103 people, um, um, they all realize, and I, all, I realize too, that it's something that's structural, it's systemic racism that's going on. It's not their own, it's not something happening to them individually. So I think for Asian Americans reading this book, they really, and they really, it re really resonates with them because they see their own stories. Many of them see their own stories here. And so they know that they really can't blame themselves. Um, you know, there are things that you could always learn to improve yourself, you know, like speaking skills or presentation skills. So you could do that but also to realize that um, there's been a history of systemic racism too. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, um, it's been hard for Asian Americans to acknowledge it. Now this particular year, I think much, uh, many more Asian Americans are acknowledging that they face racism mm -hmm. and they face racism in everyday life, in everyday life walking down the street because of the violence. Mm -hmm. They face racism because our former president, you know, called the, um, um, the pandemic said that uh, the Chinese caused the mm -hmm. pandemic. It was called the, you know, the China virus. Mm -hmm. And it, it also spurred a lot of violence, not just toward the Chinese, but to anybody who looked um, East Asian, right? And, you know, and of course it's historically, um, this leaks over to South Asians as well, you know, from the Muslim ban and everything else. So I think this, the last four years of Trump and in this particular year with the pandemic and the anti-Asian violence, people are coming on their own to realize that there is systemic racism mm -hmm. in this country. And it's um, um, part of it is that Asian Americans are left out of a lot of the stories. Mm -hmm. When we think about um, uh, the model minority or we think about Asian Americans or even race in this country, we normally think of it as a black and white story. Um, so where do Asian Americans fit in? And even newspaper reporters, when they write stories on race, lots of times, they still only use statistics on uh, black and white, even if they have statistics on Asian Americans. And sometimes they don't even collect statistics on Asian Americans. So all of that, um, you know, has to be reckoned with um, this year. Um, and it's important to recognize all of our histories and our history uh, as Asian Americans in the US, we've been here for over 150 years. And, you know, smaller groups have been here even longer, you know, in the Americas, 400 years. So um, those are those are some of the things that I think Asian Americans have to face with, face with this year. And I think uh, to go back to the question, we shouldn't have to wait <laughs> any longer. Yeah to start to um, rectify these issues, these problems of systemic racism, because um, only by doing so can we really you know, move forward um, as a country. Um, so thank you for bringing those stories 
uh, to light and to kind of putting them together in such a powerful analytic framework. Um, thank you for all the work that you've done in this regard and all the teaching that you do um, for all the students that, that, that are in your classes and then for all of us who are able to learn from you, we're really, really grateful. And I, for all of you out there, please, um, please read this book. It's called Stuck. Why Asian Americans Don't Reach the Top of the Corporate Ladder. You can get it on the Tenement website. Um, thank you for joining us for Tenement Talks. And um, this is a free program. If you're able to make a donation, that's wonderful because that helps support us. The good news is, is that we've reopened our door. So even as we're still doing virtual programs, our doors are open for tours. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Um, and you can um, join us on Saturday as we have a huge block party um, to celebrate the, the opening of the museum and more broadly, the opening of New York City. So um, Margaret, thank you so much for joining us. And um, thank you to all of you out there. Hope to see you soon at the Tenement Museum. Thank you so much, Annie. Thank you.